Well, thank you very much. And I know people who believe that Mario Monti is very sober. Okay. Um, thank you, President, for inviting me. Thank you, Monti and Monti. Vorrei iniziare con due parole in italiano. E poi tornerò all'inglese. Um, io mi ricordo quando ho letto i, i romanzi di Montalbano, c'è un personaggio che mi piace molto e che si chiama Ingrid, che è l'amichetta svedese. E Ingrid ha una qualità, non parla durante il pranzo. E mi sembra la cosa più bella del mondo. Dunque mi dispiace molto essere un keynote speaker, non facciamo in fretta e poi mangiamo tranquillamente. So the, the topic of your meeting was uh, to deal with uh, transformation, what is transforming lives, what is transforming business. And um, I'm very glad to tackle uh, in front of you tonight, very briefly, it would require much more than just a small speech, uh, the most challenging transformation we all face, uh, the one to preserve the planet. And to be honest, when I see how much time we lose in unnecessary discussions, instead of focusing on this vital uh, challenge, sometimes I feel we are not very serious. So you are now in Paris. This is the city where in uh, 2015 uh, many countries have signed and now quite all countries of the world have ratified the Paris Agreement uh, to uh, keep under control the production, the emission of, of CO2. And the common goal we have is to keep the increase of CO2 below 2%, which will be something very challenging and difficult. Uh, this is an agenda that requires collective action, as we are one planet. And there is a French astronaut, uh, Thomas Pesquet, who rightly mentioned that uh, when he came back from, from space, that, uh, you know what, there is no planet B. So be careful, because if we don't tackle this issue, it will be a, a serious threat for our own children and grandchildren. I could have brought many slides with many figures, but uh, I'm not before eating. Huh? So the only thing I want to stress is what we can try to do now all together collectively. And I know that many of the Bocconiani are in the finance sector. So what can we do to make sure that this uh, change can, uh, can take place rapidly enough? Uh, and then I will say a word on what the citizens and the corporates and, and all of us can do, even not being in finance. Um, the financial sector, as it functions right now, will not be able to reap the financing opportunities of the climate transition uh, if it cannot cope with the, cope with the climate-related uh, risks. Uh, and it's very difficult to figure out what these risks are, so I will use... Um, classification proposed by Mark Carney in one of his speeches in uh, 2015, where he made a difference between, first, the physical risks. This is the easiest to understand. You are in the insurance sector. You know that if there are floods or uh, climate events, you will have to, uh, to reimburse uh, the people who had uh, uh, an insurance contract. Of course, you have the people directly impacted and you have all the ones who might be uh, in a situation where trade and, and business is disrupted. The second group of risk is the liability risk, the impact that we could face tomorrow for action today, uh, not taking into account the necessity to tackle the, the, the climate objectives. And of course, today it seems a little bit strange, but you know that on some, any, uh, on some other issues, uh, they are years after uh, a business uh, is in place, uh, judicial uh, procedures, and it could one day hit the carbon extractors and, and emitters, and if they have liability covers, the, insurance, the, the insurers that have insured their, their business. And finally, there is also the group of transition risks, the financial risk which could result from the process of adjustment towards a low carbon economy. The changes in policy and technology in, and all the physical risks could prompt a reassessment of the value of a large range of assets as costs and opportunities become apparent. The question of the so-called stranded assets. But of course, we should not only see the risks. 
uh, in the climate transition, there are lots of opportunities for many businesses and positive transformations for our economies. And we should really be in the position to provide robust, sound, and long-term financing to fund, whoop, to fund the energy transition. This is one of the main challenges. The second one is uh, everything that has to do with uh, transportation. And the third one, which is very interesting for the Italians and the French, it is the, the, the challenge of nutrition, because the agriculture, uh, agricultural sector is also contributing to the climate change. And we want to keep the quality of good food, but of course we should make sure that it is uh, something uh, we can finance. The, in, in, if for the ones of uh, you who are interested, there is an excellent report uh, that the European Commission um, received from a group that was created by, uh, by the Vice President Dombrovskis, chaired by Christian Thiemann, who is working for AXA, is a German working here in Paris in a French company, uh, called Financing a Sustainable European Economy. He was chairing a high-level group, and there are lots of uh, excellent uh, ideas and, 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 and questions drawn from, from this group. As you know, we are in Europe, uh, we have at our disposal uh, excess of uh, available savings, more than uh, 400 billions more or less a year, and we should really allocate better this money uh, to finance uh, sustainable projects. In France, we try to, uh, to be at the forefront of this, uh, this work, so we have uh, introduced in our laws uh, an obligation of disclosure for financial in, uh, institutions. In the French energy transition law that was adopted more or less at the time of the Paris Agreement. And the interesting thing is that it does oblige the listed company to assess and monitor their exposures to climate risks. But at this stage, it is not compulsory. It's a comply or explain uh, mechanism, which is, of course, what in my opinion is right in the first stage. To make the people aware of these obligations. This provision goes even further for in institutional uh, investors. They have to provide uh, concrete information on their alignment or not with the, with the national low carbon energy. And we hope, of course, that the markets can, be, uh, can provide discipline uh, from the non-financial corporates uh, and that they will be instrumental toward the chains uh, on the two degrees compliance. The very interesting thing, I participated in a meeting uh, during the One Planet Summit in December in Paris, is that you also have now some people from the human resources uh, field who are trying to, uh, uh, to find uh, board members uh, with, uh, with the, the skills necessary to be in the position to, to look at, the, at the, the reports and to make them more, more concrete. So there are lots of ideas coming from the, the private sectors for the private sector. But of course, these disclosures are by far not enough. They just provide a snapshot of the, of the risks. What we have to look at is how to make sure that we have not only the picture, but the video of, of the evolution of, of companies. And this is also a big challenge. And of course, one day we will move from the comply or explain approach to something that is more uh, uh, binding. The, the financing of the transition itself um, is facing two challenges. One is a quantitative one, to have enough money to finance the, the good projects. But also there is a, a, the necessity to be very careful on the quality of the projects, the so-called greenwashing, the temptation of institutions to get some new consumers to promise uh, greening or sustainability without, uh, without content. And here I must pay tribute, not only because Mario Monti invited me, but uh, to the work made by the European Commission, because the European Commission, after the creation of this working group, has already adopted an action plan on all these issues, which is at this stage the most ambitious uh, blueprint ever published so far worldwide, even if the Financial Stability Board has also entitled Michael Bloomberg to to, to work on these issues, but sometimes we should be proud of what is happening in Europe. And uh, the idea is to be at the forefront of uh, a taxonomy. This is uh, le mot à la mode. Hein? But how do you make a classification of, uh, of the investments and of the risks in order to be sure that we avoid the greenwashing? 
the Commission has also proposed in its legislative package now to have uh, benchmarks and, and, and disclosures and financial advices at the level which is the right one, uh, which is not the national one, but the one of the financial market for, for financial services. And here, a very important point, um, because I'm not a Boconian, but I know the articles of Mario Monti, one thing he always stressed is the fact that Europe has act in favor of the future generations very often, taking into account the interest of the unborn or of the very young people who are not voting, who are not the ones for, uh, for whom the politicians are acting, but who are the ones uh, taking into consideration what uh, we will suffer or benefit from, from the future. Um, and to, to conclude on, on this part on finance, one word of central bank on central banks. What can we do and what are we trying to do? Uh, and I'm saying uh, I'm not uh, preaching for myself because the decision was taken before I joined the, the Banque de France. But the Banque de France has launched a very interesting network of central banks and supervisors worldwide. Uh, in Europe, you have uh, many uh, central banks like the Bank of England that was at the forefront because Mar Mark Carney, as I quoted him because in, he was one of the first in 2015 to, to tackle the issue in a speech called the tragedy of the horizon. But you also have the Bundesbank, you have uh, non-European big institutions like the, the Bank of Mexico, the Bank of China, the Supervisory Authority of Singapore. And I know that here in the room you are coming from uh, from all continents, and it's very important that Europe can drive, but that the others are playing with us. And we hope that many others will join. The ECB has joined recently, which was, a, which was a great pleasure for us. And one of the very interesting thing when you launch something that is an innovation like that is that I appreciated very much the fact that they created three working groups. I'm not going to enter into the details, but the chairs of the free working groups are not French, but they are working with the civil servants of the Banque de France. So they are working cross-border, and this is also part of the new, um, the new mood we have to create. It is a cross-border problem. If we remain all uh, prisoners of the national vision of politics and action, we will go nowhere. And, uh, Saying this, of course, I'm just talking about sustainability. Um, one word on what they intend to do, it's to, to, to work on the risk side, of course, but to make sure that uh, very quickly we can uh, scanning up the green finance. And we have also tried in the Banque de France to adopt uh, rules for ourselves, at least for our private investment, for our pension funds and for uh, our own uh, private investment. One of the key questions for the future is, uh, will it one day hit uh, monetary policy? But uh, at this stage, I'm uh, just saying that uh, the monetary policy remains that it is with one goal. Um, and there are many other fora, of course, working on it. Uh, the, I've quoted the FSB, the G20. But I want to say that the Italian presidency of the G7 last year also uh, give uh, an impetus which was very useful. Now to conclude, what, what is beyond the, 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 the financial sector, uh, what is the real challenge? Uh, many other decisions uh, should be taken. And for example, there is a debate right now in the pro proposals of the Commission. The Commission is proposing to uh, give a green uh, supporting factor to some investments in prudential terms. I think it's a mistake. You cannot deal with all aspects of such a challenge only by using financial or macro prudential tools. You really have to, uh, to make sure that the, the governments are, are, are taking the right measures. One of the measures that is missing at this stage is, uh, is a real market of, of carbon. It is uh, clear that uh, as long as we don't have it, we'll not be in a position to tackle seriously the issue. Then we have to include uh, all the stakeholders. The, the fascinating element in this, in this uh, question of sustainability is that you have to deal with global issues on which no one state in the world can act alone. But at the same time, if people don't change their habits to go to work in the morning, if they don't, uh, uh, if they don't um, change their, their if, 
if they don't eat maybe less meat or very concrete things in the daily life, we will not be able to tackle it neither. So it changes completely the perspective of what politics is about. It is not just taking the decision at the top and, and, and sign treaties. Uh, it is really to make sure that the, the, the international commitments then are uh, translated into, into real life. And one of the interesting aspects of the Paris uh, summit was that, and I say it in front of the Italian ambassador we, we like very much in Paris, uh, not against the old fashioned diplomats, but it's really because we need to include the NGOs. And it was done at this stage, and we also need to include the citizens. And then, of course, we need to include the universities. So I hope that the Bocconi is, uh, is uh, keen to, to, to train a young generation that will be uh, not only aware of that, but that will go uh, further than everything that is on the table uh, right now. And I don't want to conclude with a, with a negative note, but of course the, the withdrawal of the US uh, from the Paris Agreement was a, was a big backla backlash, and, and it's something that makes in an objective way more difficult to reach the, uh, the goals. But I remember when Emmanuel Macron last year reacted to Trump's decision with the slogan, make the planet great again, uh, the reaction, uh, the idea was also to be inclusive with all the Americans and all the entities in America uh, keen to, to continue to work with us. And the result was fantastic and beyond all expectations. Uh, some cities like San Francisco, some businesses, some NGOs, some researchers answered and even uh, some of them decided to to come to Paris and to help us. So thank you so much. Uh, it was just uh, an overview. It was a survol, as we would say in French. But I think it's an issue that is very important. And at least I hope that for us, it was a, for, for all of us, uh, it was a good uh, reason not to think only that Europe is divided and cannot provide uh, impetus on, on important issues. Thank you very much. I think we have a Q&A now. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvie. Thank you very much. Very inspiring. Any question from the floor? Otherwise, maybe, yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. I was sure, David, that you would be the first. So, Sylvie, on this point, one cow is equivalent to a car driving for 12,500 kilometers in CO2 emission. We have 1.5 million cows today on the planet. And China has just issued the requirement of reducing cows and bulls' protein intake. Because to be honest, it's the only way we can actually deal with CO2 emission. Because with the rise of emerging market, you can't help them not to have energy. But you can easily substitute protein intake from cows to anything else. So can I ask you why actually in Europe, the commission, even Mark Carney, I've not actually tackled that a third of all CO2 emission comes out of a protein intake that can easily be substituted. Rather than, you know, for example, pushing this idea that a Tesla actually produce more CO2 than it will ever save. Uh, and hence, we're just, you know, tricking consumer. It looks good, but it ain't good. Well, the only reality is we need to reduce the number of cows on the planet. And with three more billion people coming, it's hard. What do you think about it? Okay, let's draw the first conclusion, eat pasta. <laughs> and no, but it's very serious. I know that there are uh, lots of, uh, of uh, research made by the Center for Food and Nutrition from Barilla. It's, it's not a minor issue at all. And that's the reason why I mention agriculture. And if you read the high level, uh, the, the report of the high level group shared by, by Timan, the question of agriculture is a very important one and it, it is tackled. Of course, we also have to, to look at the way Europe is financed. And one of the good occasion to uh, look at it would also maybe be the reform of the common agricultural policy. Uh, what I observe, to be honest, is a, is a very rapid change in the young generation uh, as far as uh, food, is, food is concerned. Uh, I am at home circumvented by 
by very radicalized vegetarians. So I can tell you that this is something that is happening. Uh, but as I said, we should put the emphasis on the three aspects, not only transportation and energy, but also agriculture. Yeah. Any, maybe I have a question. Yes, of course. Um, private equity, you mentioned a various sort of, uh, I think, to my knowledge at least, there are relatively few investment fund or private equity fund specialized specifically on sustainability. In Italy, for example, I know about Ambienta, but it's not a huge fund. I think, why do you think uh, big investors are still, or seem to me at least, still far from focusing heavily on this uh, segment of companies? There are many companies that maybe are at a smaller stage and would need investment to develop. Uh, and we still have a lot of need to subsidize and so on. Why are investors not more aggressive in this sector, in your opinion? It's an excellent cash question. I'm not sure I have the answer. One thing is sure is that the awareness of the risk is quite recent. The second thing is that it's sometimes very complicated. I will take an example. Maybe someone of uh, Saint-Gobain is in this room. I don't know if someone from Saint-Gobain here. If you take Saint-Gobain, one of the big French company, Saint-Gobain is producing glass, uh, not only for cars, but also uh, something I cannot say it in English. I have no idea. I can say it in German, not in English, because I work for Saint-Gobain in Germany. Um, la laine de verre. So the the, you know, the, the, the materials you need to isolate your room, which is done with a very fine uh, uh, fiber, how do you say? Uh, lana di vetro, come bello. Glass faser in German. And of course you could say, for example, it, it's good because this is one of the things we need to, uh, to isolate our, our houses and to renovate. At the same time, and I have nothing against Saint-Gobain, but at the same time, it's a very highly, uh, it, it's consuming a lot of energy. To produce glass, you, you, it requires lots of energy. How do you balance that? And this is exactly the reason why we need a taxonomy. We need to define very granular criterion of how you can deal with all these issues. Because if you don't, you could uh, have people saying that investing in whatever thing could be, uh, could be good for the planet. And it's really quite complicated. I've taken this example because this is one of the, the most easy to understand, even if I know that in front of this public I could be more sophisticated. But in my opinion, this is the reason why I think the Commission is right to accelerate uh, the, the, the work on how to, to, to evaluate the, the risks and to balance them, because very often, on, on environmental issue, you have pros and cons in each action you do. Yeah. Thank you. There is some. Uh, yeah, we, there is a question over there. Anche le donne hanno la possibilità di chiedere. Eh? So, thank you for taking the question. Um, the Commission has always been at the forefront of innovation in promoting sustainable targets. Most of the time, fighting against the local governments. So my question is, from your experience, how much understanding there is among the political establishment, the political scene, about the concept of sustainability, and how much belief there is. Is this something that people see as something they have to do because they have to show they do something? Is there real belief? Is completely disbelief from your experience? Now, first of all, thank you so much for saying that the Commission is providing something good, uh, that sometimes Europe is not making everything wrong, as we read quite uh, often in the press. So I really think that the, the direction is the right one. In the attitude of the national governments, you have a mix. Sometimes it is not easy, because if you take some of the governments uh, in, in Europe, they actually, uh, uh, their, their business model is based on the use of coal. Some of them, like Germany, Germany decided to leave the, to, 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 to abandon, to give up the, the nuclear energy, and for this reason, 
in the period before they will be uh, uh, they will develop the sustainable energy they have even increased their production of, of co2 so you have so many different situations in france we are very lucky because the nuclear energy has never been conceived for that but now we can say oh look we are very clean I'm not quite sure that nuclear energy is perfectly clean uh, when you don't know what to do with the, the waste, but this is another issue. So it's very complicated because, of course, they are in the hands of the local lobbies. You also have to make sure that the price of energy for your industry remains uh, affordable because you cannot destroy your, your energy. And in some other fields like, uh, like agriculture, I remember, for example, last year when we voted the free trade agreement with Canada, there were lots of protests in France by the people producing uh, meat. The cause uh, David Davide mentioned before. And when I discussed with the producers, I realized that they were not aware that their problem was less Canada than the change in the way the consumers are looking at food. So, and these changes require some, t some time, and we don't have too much time. That's the reason why I really believe that uh, universities and, and all the people in charge of education and also the medias and should really explain and explain again that it is not something we can escape. And not even the biggest uh, power on earth, the United States, will escape the consequences of climate change. They already had storms in Florida, etc. So no one can escape. It's something we have in common. It's something we share. And when you explain, and there are so many uh, excellent fields, the one of, of um, Al Gore some years ago, but also in France, there was also another type of film on, on this. People are interested. But of course, it's a, it's a battle, and we have to make it together. Thank you. Thank you to Sylvie for this uh, inspiring speech tonight. No, no, but uh, no, no. Don't believe I will stop before a woman has asked a question. Please, one of you. Yes, look. Okay. You have to motivate them. That's excellent. I think they wanted to eat, actually. They wanted to eat? No, yeah. the, okay. men, the men are the not men. so. <laughs> the men want to eat. Good evening. I'm uh, curious to know more about actually European on, uh, opinion on the European directive on non-financial reporting. You were talking about the importance of disclosure, about the importance of mapping uh, risks. And uh, don't you believe that actually already that directive implies that all companies must uh, report on those topics? So environmental, social and governance risks. Thank you. No, you're right. Um, of course, we should not increase only the rules and the, the, the obligations we put on the shoulders of, of the people who are making business. This is perfectly clear. That's the reason why I mentioned before the role of the boards. Because one thing is to put something in, in, in a directive or in a law. Another one is to make sure that the composition of your board uh, brings the company to the stage where this is taken seriously. And uh, of course, this is something complicated. But I think if we continue to discuss on directives when they are all hungry, then they will not forgive me. So I think I stop here. Thank you. No, no, no. Stop, 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 stop. We have something for you here. No? There was actually another question there. You, you, you moved too, too early. Sorry. But it's a man. Sorry, you, very you nice take, question. Do you take the question? Uh, yes, of green capital markets, uh, uh, social bond issues, they're becoming mainstream in the international debt capital markets. Agence Française has been issuing the first green bond last year. Great success. It's been followed by Belgium. But there's been also issues on the social market. How do you see from a central bank this trend that is becoming mainstream in the national capital markets from a central bank standpoint? Well, uh, these are interesting initiatives, and the, the most interesting aspect is the fact that the market reacted very positively. I know Belgium did also issue uh, bonds, uh, which are green bonds, etc. So this is, this is great because it shows that even if there are some uh, problems to convince the establishment, at least the private sector could be a driving force, and I really believe in it. On the other hand, we should be very careful because I would like to know precisely what 
the French government is doing with the money that comes from the green bonds. So we have to make sure, not saying in only in France, but we have to make sure that then the money is really used for green purposes. And this is quite complicated. So this is all, the, the, the risk of greenwashing does exist in companies and it could exist also in the public sector. And in any case, we should also a little bit reduce the amount of debt, not to invent new instruments to make sure that we can sell our debt. Uh, there is a, actually a last, no, this is the last one, right? It's yeah. a, uh, this is really the last one now. So uh, my question will be about the Kyoto Protocol. And uh, the first part is about your personal opinion, uh, your personal attitude to, uh, towards this protocol. And my second part of uh, this question is about the global misunderstanding that uh, given uh, some countries decided to retreat from this protocol, we really have now at the global level. Thank you. Well, you know, what I personally think about it is not very uh, decisive, uh, to be honest, on such an issue. No, I remember perfectly because I was at the European Commission when, when all these things were adopted. Uh, here again, Europe was at the forefront and we opened the door for new developments. The key question now, uh, and I focused on, on carbon emission, but there are many other aspects on biodiversity, on, on many issues, but the how can I say, we also have to evaluate what we are doing and I'm a little bit sad to see that not even such a huge challenge uh, is enough to change the way the states deal with international cross-border issues. In my opinion, we don't have the global governance we need. We don't have it. We pretend and we have heard, and I'm not going to say it in front of an Italian public, we had here in France last year, you had in your political debate, people pretending that sovereignty does still exist at the national level. It might be true on some issues, and it is perfectly normal that we all feel uh, very, how can I say, we, we like our identity, our traditions, our languages, etc. But we cannot uh, deliver if we don't act at a cross-border level. Europe is one uh, scale, or, but not even the regional uh, scale, the European scale is enough. And I was at the G7 last week in Whistler uh, with the finance ministers where we prepared the, the one of today. And I was thinking that probably with the current mood in the world, we would not create the United Nations, we would not create the United uh, uh, Europe, we would not create the Bretton Woods institutions. We are very shy, we lack totally ambitions, and we, give, we allow people who are simply telling lies to our citizens to win elections, which is not only a problem because we dislike them or whatever, the problem is that the we are not going to solve some of the, uh, the very hot problems we have in front of us, like climate change, but also fighting against terrorism or how to tackle the migration issue. Or, and, and even when, when, I, when I look back to what I've experienced myself, because I, I was not there just after the Second World War, um, to be honest, when I remember people like uh, Bundeskanzler Kohl or, or François Mitterrand, or uh, Thomas Opado Askio, but people who died, uh, the generation that has left us, I think they would not be very proud of us. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvie. Sylvie Solodon. Thank you very much for your speech tonight. This is also for you. And this is a medal of the old building of Bocconi to remember the evening, but also to get you even closer to Bocconi. Thank you again. Thank you, Sylvie.